For the Wild podcast and all of our other projects are community supported. Please head over to kickstarter.com and search One Million Redwoods to make a pledge and help us plant millions of trees, native plants, and fungal companions to mitigate climate change and rapid species loss. The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. Today we are speaking with George Mombio. George is the author of the best-selling books, Feral, Rewilding the Land, Sea, and Human Life, The Age of Consent, A Manifesto for a New World Order, and Captive State, The Corporate Takeover of Britain, as well as the investigative travel books, Poisoned Arrows, Amazon Watershed, and No Man's Land. His latest book is Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for an Age of Crisis. He also writes a weekly column for The Guardian. Well, thank you so much, George, for joining us today. This is really an honor and a pleasure. No, that's that's totally my pleasure. Thank you. So I want to just jump right into the ecological phenomenon of trophic cascades, which describes how top predators can shape entire ecosystems through the cascading dynamics that they spark, like wolves in Yellowstone, whose reintroduction not only reduce numbers of deer, but also alter the behavior of the deer, allowing trees and shrubs to return in places that were heavily grazed in the absence of the wolf, such as along the waterways and the open valleys. And it's amazing because trees on the stream banks means reduced erosion, cooler water, more shelter for fish, for beaver. And then more vegetation also means more songbirds, more bears, eagles, and ravens benefiting from the scavenging of wolf kills. Also, small mammal populations were rising as coyotes became meals for wolves. And then we have hawks and foxes and badgers and weasels in turn eating more small animals. (laughs) So it's this incredibly heartening example that such a significant return of ecological flourishing is still possible in this monocultured and degraded and compartmentalized world. And I know that this is a topic that brings you great excitement, and I loved your narration of the trophic cascades in Yellowstone. So, you know, I have a kind of a specific question on, are there any trophic cascades or top predators that you see as being unfeasible to restore or reintroduce? And are there any attempted reintroductions that you've seen to be unsuccessful or have unintended consequences? Well, the the thing about reestablishing species that are missing from an ecosystem is that the key challenge really is political rather than ecological. So for instance in my country here the United Kingdom we could reintroduce wolves tomorrow and it would work ecologically fine you know they they would actually live in my home city foraging out of the dustbins and they would be perfectly happy there would be no problem at all about wolves re-establishing themselves and breeding just fine if you can bring people along with you. And what we have to do in every case is to ensure that people are happy with what we're proposing. Because if you don't have that support, then people are just going to kill the reintroduced animals. People are going to be terrified of them. It's not going to be done in such a way that people will accept it. You know, I don't want wolves foraging in my dustbins, thanks very much. But I would like to see wolves, for instance, in the Scottish Highlands. But for that to happen, 
we need to do it very diplomatically and we need to ensure that everyone's behind it. And so mostly when reintroductions don't work, it's for political reasons rather than for ecological reasons. Sometimes there are ecological reasons. Um, there was an attempt um, once to reintroduce links into the Gran Paradiso Park in Italy and they didn't do it very well. They um, introduced three males and that was it. So unsurprisingly that reintroduction failed. <laughs> but there, there will be cases where it's just not going to work well for ecological reasons but those are going to be rare cases. Generally the crucial challenge and it's always a really difficult one is to persuade people that their lives will be improved more than they will be harmed by bringing back our magnificent wildlife. And, you know, you would think that Yellowstone was a fabulous example of this because it's brought so much wealth into the economy, having the wolves there because of the people coming to visit and then sort of staying in hotels and eating in restaurants and all the other ways in which they bring money into the economy. But even so, the hostility, the sort of deep, almost biblical hostility towards the wolf there is such that the ranchers you know, continue to exterminate wolves immediately outside the borders of the park, which is a tragedy and, and completely unnecessary. Well, as I've been hearing you talk about the issues in the UK, as it's more of a people issue when trophic cascades don't function because people don't always want them. They Like you were saying, they don't want wolves in their backyard. And so I was interested in the principles and also the challenges of restoring, say, uh, trophic diversity in Europe versus what it is to do that here on Turtle Island. Well, the way many people see large predators and large animals in general is just as ornaments of the ecosystem. Look, look at these um, interesting exotic creatures and uh, it might be nice to see them but they're not really that important because there's only a few of them and in a way the way I was taught biology when I took my degree back in the days when the world was young pretty well sort of followed that pattern because we learnt that ecosystems were controlled from the bottom up that a particular climate and a particular soil type would give rise to a particular kind of vegetation and that would harbour a particular population of herbivores, which in turn would support a population of carnivores. But what we've found increasingly as more and more work has been done is that a whole load of ecosystems are controlled from the top down. That it's the large animals, the, the big carnivores and the big herbivores, which really run the whole ecosystem and change everything. So when they're extirpated, when they disappear, the whole thing can collapse and when they come back it can be spectacularly restored as we've seen in, in many instances. And what happens is that the big predators will control not only the numbers of their prey but also more importantly the behaviour of their prey. So they will ensure that the herbivores avoid certain areas and concentrate in others and that means you get a much more diverse mosaic of habitats kicking off and the vegetation obviously responds to the amount of grazing pressure that it gets and that in turn means that the soil type gradually begins to change because the nutrients become concentrated in some places often the herbivores will feed in one place and then run off and gather in another and r release their their excrement there and so the manure that ground and then it can change you know in Yellowstone according to some work it's changed the rivers. The reintroduction of wolves has changed the course of the rivers because the returning vegetation stabilises the banks of the rivers and so they don't move around so much, they don't meander so much. So the actual morphology of the landscape is changed. And we see this most spectacularly actually at sea. Some of the examples of marine trophic cascades are just remarkable. I mean, for example, it turns out that Whales are absolutely essential for the functioning of the ecosystem of the Southern Oceans. And the reason for that is that they tend to feed at depth deeper than plants can flourish because there's not enough light there for them. And then they come up to the surface to poo, to release their, their faeces. And it turns out they, they can't poo when they're diving because a lot of their physiology shuts down. So they come to the surface and they release these great 
punamids, these, these great plumes of nutrients. And that fertilizes the plankton living in the surface waters, which are the basis of the whole ecosystem. And that process of fertilization is absolutely critical. And interestingly, as the plankton proliferates, eating the whale poo, and in proliferating it sucks carbon dioxide out of the surface waters, ultimately out of the atmosphere, and then it sinks away into the abyssal zone, it takes that carbon dioxide out of circulation for thousands of years. So, though not in a huge way, but it has an impact in reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So, the whales change the climate. Blue Gibraltar, young man. Blow that trumpet, young, young man. Calm and easy, young man. Tell everybody, young man. My God, say, young man. That they got to meet, young man. Oh, blow Gibraltar, young man. Oh, blow that trumpet, young man. Loud and louder, young man. Want to wake my people, young man. mentioning on land the how the soil composition shifts in the absence of native megafauna and even the acidity of that soil and the leaf litter composition and the different fecal matters it's really incredible just to see how everything works together in this way and when you take one piece out there's a whole domino effect that gets destroyed in its wake no, that's right. And, and there's loads of examples. Uh, the other example was what happened when sea otters were killed in many parts of the Pacific coast. They were hunted to extinction locally on many parts of the American Pacific coast for the fur trade. And what's happened in many, many cases where that's taken place is that the sea urchins have proliferated. And as a result of that, they have grazed away the kelp forest to nothing and totally changed the ecosystem where you previously had kelp forest giving rise to a tremendous variety of life, you now have nothing. You just have these empty seas in which only a few fish species adapted to open water can survive. But you bring back the otters and the whole ecosystem can return. Wow, thank you for helping us understand more deeply just what is at stake when not only the top predators are removed, but how that affects an entire ecosystem and the communities of other creatures. And it really clarifies the Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction and how we're actually losing so many species so quickly because it's not just one species here, one species there, and they're all separated. But to think that when you're losing a few very important keystone species and that how that unravels the entire web so that even more species then are removed from the system. Yeah, it really gives a, a very sad vision of how we're losing so much so quickly. The famous quote by John Muir is that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And what we're doing is picking out crucial species, what are called keystone species. In ecology, a keystone species is an animal which exerts a far greater ecological impact than its numbers or its weight alone would suggest. And so it has a sort of crucial role as an ecosystem engineer. So the wolves in Yellowstone, the whales in, in the sea, beavers are another classic example because beavers can completely change the ecology of rivers, creating far more habitats. You get much bigger fish, you get far more fish, you get larger numbers of ducks, larger numbers of otters, of amphibians, of reptiles, of insects where there are beavers. You even get more bats where there are beavers because the way they coppice the trees and so you get some trees growing, some trees fall and creates these little glades which where the bats love to hunt. So it, it just changes the whole ecosystem and th these keystone species are absolutely crucial. And we think, oh, we can do without them. That's not an issue. You know, it's just it's only one species. And you pull them out 
you pick out that that element and because it's hitched to everything else in the universe it's like trying to pull a piece of wool out of a sweater you just keep pulling and pulling and pulling and eventually you've unraveled uh, the whole sweater it really brings up how humans have tried to understand or misunderstand entire ecosystems and the ecological consequences that come with our actions and i've studied ecological restoration at university and there's this overwhelming lack of appreciation for how little we do know and it's interesting because the word restoration itself speaks to this idea that we can return to ecologies of the past yet the climate is ever changing and even our understanding of the past of what was quote wild is vague I was able to interview the ethnobotanist Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she speaks on how our ecological classifications are based upon the composition of our ecosystems when they were in transition between being tended by indigenous peoples and then by colonizers. So I guess I, I bring this caution to discussions on rewilding and reintroductions of predators, you know, although I'm very excited by it, because I feel like we need to come to the table with so many more questions than answers. You know, how accurate is our understanding of past dynamics? How have the plants and insects since evolved in the absence of their megafaunal kin? How will these interactions fare as the climate changes? I just feel like we've made so many mistakes as humans already, and we must tread lightly with humility and the openness to listen. We have this climate chaos and mass extinctions are unprecedented for life on earth and you know just for this i truly appreciated the description of rewilding that you provided in feral and i just want to read this little quote that i pulled out the main aim of rewilding is to restore to the greatest extent possible ecology's dynamic interactions rewilding is restoring what ecologists call trophic diversity enhancing the number of opportunities for animals, plants, and other creatures to feed on each other to rebuild the broken strands in the web of life, end quote. I'm wondering, do you foresee us being able to be guided by a fusion of science and traditional ecological knowledge and our innate ability just to observe and communicate with our ecosystems to adaptively rewild our degraded lands especially in a time of such uncertainty, climactically and politically. Mm. And the main teacher, from my point of view, as far as rewilding is concerned, is nature. It is the living world. And the way I see rewilding is not trying to restore past ecosystems, because for the reasons you point out, that's impossible. For a start, we don't fully understand what they were. And we have often, as you say, misclassified them and misunderstood them, and we've described what we think are natural functioning ecosystems, whereas because they've lost their predators and, and their big herbivores and the rest of it, because we wiped them out, and on Turtle Island you lost most of yours 14,000 years ago, we're actually describing artefacts of human intervention. But also because the climate has changed, because the soils have been depleted, because of so many things, nitrate deposition, you know, five kilograms per hectare per year just coming down from burning fossil fuels in cars falling on the ground this massive amount of nitrate we're putting up in the atmosphere so for all these reasons we're never going to recreate past ecosystems and i don't think that should be our aim anyway we should try to uh, allow ecosystems to create themselves with the greatest trophic diversity as i suggest with the greatest possibility but also with the understanding that we're not trying to create a fixed outcome. We're trying to allow natural processes to resume. And in a way, the process is the outcome. We're not trying to reach any promised land. We're not trying to reach any particular place. We're trying to allow nature to do what it does best, which is to behave as a dynamic, complex system. And a system with all sorts of unexpected and, in my view, delightful, wonderful, emergent characteristics, part of the joy of nature and the joy of rewilding in particular is that you never quite know what you're going to get. There's all this serendipity in there. There's all these features of a complex system are going to take us by surprise and often in a completely delightful way. And the problem is we've been treating nature and studying nature as if it's a simple system, a simple linear system. 
And as the example of trophic cascades, and you know, even in discussing it, we've really simplified it. But as this example shows, it's actually a, a tremendously complex system. And it has all those complex system characteristics, which, well, it's what makes it magnificent. And so when we're trying to restore nature, it's not restoring it to a past state, it's restoring it to its maximum possible state, given our current circumstances. And it's having sort of brought back the key elements, particularly the missing species, particularly sort of getting rid of fences and other barriers to migration, just enabling stuff to get going again. We should, to the greatest extent possible, I think, stand back and let it happen. We don't need to manage nature for the sake of nature. When, when you look at how people believe that nature has to be stewarded by us, well, in the words of a friend of mine, how did nature cope before humans came along to look after it? You know, and of course, it did very well for about four billion years before we turned up and say, oh, we can do this better, whereupon it started doing very badly. And, and so it's allowing these dynamic processes to unfold and be driven by all these amazing species and their interactions, their interactions with each other, their interactions with the physical environment. And who knows what's going to happen? We can't predict that. And that's what makes it so fascinating. And what we find again and again is that when you allow such processes to happen, and ecologists come along and study what's going on. They say, wait a minute, this isn't behaving like it says in the textbooks. This is something completely different. And you, you find so many of your assumptions challenged because you suddenly discover that what you were studying before was not natural processes, but the human interaction with natural processes. And actually, we're sort of observing ourselves. We think that we're looking at a different system, but in fact, we're looking in the mirror. Woods down here are quiet now. Well, once they rang with shouts and laughter The songs that echoed through the veil As children left their fall of after The streams that once we jumped and swam The old oak tree we gathered under The child inside has lost these sights The child inside has lost the wonder I love the vision of an ecologist going, whoa, whoa, this was not what I expected. This was not what was in the textbooks. And honestly, I think that gives me the most hope when thinking about restoring ecosystems is that we don't know and we're not in control of how nature replenishes. In a way, of course, I see that the earth was doing quite fine without us <laughs> before we came on the scene and that so many humans have created such incredible disruptions to these systems. And then on the other hand, the book Tending the Wild by Kat Anderson really describes how humans were able to interact with the landscape and actually create more biodiversity by tending the wild. So there's these two different views on that. And then fast forward to now, and we're dealing with massive pollution and clear cuts and just devastation. And I'm launching this One Million Redwoods project where I'm not so interested in restoration ecology per se. I'm interested in renewal ecology or the idea of how to promote as much biodiversity by replanting as possible in these places that are so devastated that the soil has been stripped of its nutrients and the canopy is gone and, you know, how to replace as much biodiversity as possible for a changing climate, but also knowing that 
where is that point where you go and nurture and then you step back? I guess this is kind of a two-part question of looking in the past and seeing when humans actually were ecosystem engineers in a positive way. And then how do we learn from that in today's world when we are dealing with the Anthropocene and just so much degraded land? The first thing to say is that it's not strictly true in my reading of it that the human interaction with nature enhanced diversity. What it tended to enhance was abundance. That there were certain species that we wanted to favour in our hunter-gatherer past because they were of use to us. And so we tended to manage to tend to garden the, the living world in order to enhance the preponderance of those species. And in certain cases, for instance with the Mebengokri and the Amazon, they moved in trees which weren't growing in an area and did a sort of very, very extensive forest gardening, sort of putting in islands of trees they called apete in the savanna areas, which gradually fused into rainforest. But you're not necessarily enhancing diversity there as changing the, the composition of species, but you're certainly enhancing the abundance of certain species. So I'm just a bit concerned that I, I feel the issue's been somewhat overplayed, that we sort of have this vision of people actually making the planet more diverse. Well, you know, that's, that's difficult for us to do because we don't operate at evolutionary time spans. And, and in fact, we, I think we were doing something slightly different. And the truth is, you know, and it's an uncomfortable truth, and a truth I find very difficult because I've worked for many years of my life with Indigenous people and Indigenous people have helped me to form my world view that our engagement with nature has seldom been a harmonious one. And in fact, you can map the arrival of Homo sapiens in different parts of the world by the sudden collapse of large animal populations. Um, in fact, it's a far more accurate way of mapping than finding the presence of humans, because when we first turn up, for instance, in Turtle Island, we have very low numbers, leave very few artefacts behind. You know, you might, if you're extremely lucky, find early Clovis flints in a few locations and you think, OK, this is the earliest sign of human beings here. So this shows us when human beings arrived. But actually, human beings might have been there for several hundred years before you see any evidence of their presence, because what they leave behind is so thinly scattered. But what you see in the paleontological record rather than the archaeological record gives you a much clearer view of when people turn up, because you'll see these tremendous numbers of very large animals. Um, the megafauna is the default state of all ecosystems all over the world. Um, ecosystems were dominated by huge animals. So for instance, in your continent, um, there were short-faced bears, twice the size of grizzly bears, um, with enormous teeth and fangs, who were specialized, uh, seemed to be specialists in driving giant American lions and saber-tooths, giant saber-tooths off their prey. There was a bird with a 26-foot wingspan. There were nine-foot Pacific salmon with fangs. There were giant bison. There were the giant ground sloths. There were loads of different species of elephant and mastodon and gomphothere and mammoth. There was just an extraordinary range of mind-blowing creatures, a, a beaver six foot long. I mean, it just went, goes on and on. Armadillos the size of small cars. And you just see this remarkably rapid disappearance of those species. And it's the same elsewhere. It's the same in Madagascar. It's the same on all the o oceanic islands. It's the same in Europe, for that matter, where, where the sort of where modern humans turn up, displacing the previous human populations and all the megafauna goes as well and that sort of sudden break in the fossil record and in the animal remains shows us when people turned up so you know we were not good news anywhere now of course it is the case that after a while after the initial phase of massive destruction people settled down people began to recognize environmental limits the limits became clearer because there wasn't this tremendous abundance of huge, naive prey that people could just walk up to and stick a spear into 
and people realised that they had to live much more lightly. And so there were a lot of social codes developed by people. But, you know, just as we have a hazy view and often a distorted view of ecosystems because of what we saw when, as Europeans, we first turned up somewhere, we have a very similar hazy and distorted view in terms of what we saw as Europeans when we turned up in other people's lands. So a classic example of this. Francisco Oriana, the um, first European to go down the Amazon, and he described these massive cities beside the Amazon with 100,000 people or more, vast earth ramparts, with the land cleared all around and people farming, highly sophisticated farming systems, highly stratified societies with a big division of labour. And then he completed his journey, came back, wrote it all up, 40 years later, the next lot of European explorers went down the Amazon and they said, this guy was a liar. There's nothing, nothing here. It's just, it's just forest. There's no people, there's no cities. He's just making it all up. He was just trying to big himself up by describing these fake civilizations that he claims to have found. Well, it wasn't until the 1980s that archaeological evidence reveals that he was actually correct. These cities were there. But what had happened between his arrival and the arrival of the next Europeans 40 years later, was that diseases had passed down the trade routes from the Caribbean, European diseases, things like common cold, smallpox, measles, were absolutely lethal to the native peoples of South America and had completely wiped out those civilizations. And that the hunter-gatherer peoples, who by the time, you know, 40 years on, were, were living in the Vazia floodplains of the Amazon amongst the giant trees which had then grown turn out in many cases to have been the remnant populations that had previously been in great civilizations and that the only people who survived were those who fled into the wild and lived as hunter-gatherers where they couldn't be infected through the transmission caused by close contact within cities and so the hunter-gatherers who we see in, I mean, some parts of the Amazon have always had hunter-gatherers, others, uh, those hunter-gatherers are actually the post-apocalyptic remnant population of what had once been a great civilization. <laughs> To detail out what it looks like to be in relationship to land at this point of modern humanity in the Anthropocene, because of course we can look back at these histories that are honestly just horrifying. And now we're at a place where we can choose to rewild, we can choose to renew these lands. So how do you see this relationship for modern humans of being able to involve ourselves, engage with the land, but also when do we step back? Well, there are opportunities here. You know, in any crisis, there's, there's horror and fear but, and threat, but there's also opportunity. And what we've seen happening in many parts of the world, including in the Americas and in Europe, is large areas being vacated by farmers. 
And this is the result of globalization. Now, you know, we might like or not like the globalization of the food supply, and there's many real problems with it. But one thing it has done is to make places which are marginal for agricultural production no longer economically viable to farm in. And in particular, these are places with where livestock has been produced at a fairly low level and places where actually there's a very high proportion of destruction to production. I mean, um, grazed livestock are, uh, turns out to be a phenomenally inefficient way of using the land. So we consume on average 81 grams of protein per day. And one gram of that comes from grazed livestock, but livestock grazing occupies twice the area worldwide that crops occupy. So you can see what a fantastically inefficient land use this is. And in many places, it just can't be sustained except with farm subsidies. And when the subsidies go, the farming goes. And, and that's a tragedy for the, the farming communities. But it means that suddenly a whole load of land becomes available for nature. And rather than allowing, say, the forestry industry to move in there or the mining industry or some other form of extractive and destructive industry, that's the time where we should say, wait a minute, this is time to give something back to this planet we have ravaged and destroyed to such an extent. Here now is a time where we say, let's mend, let's renew, let's bring life back to the barren wastes and allow it to re-establish itself. And so there is a tremendous opportunity, very large areas of land potentially becoming available. And, and this opportunity where it's grasped does amazing things. And the classic example is in Patagonia, where people like Doug and Chris Tompkins started partly buying up land, started partly by negotiating with the governments and with other landowners and have just created a fantastic network of national parks in which life has come bounding back and all sorts of species have been reintroduced, re-established. And this is now in both Chile and Argentina, a great source of national pride that you know this is one of the few parts of the world where nature is actually doing better than it was before. And suddenly people have realised, actually, we can do better as a result of this in terms of employment, in terms of income. We can actually make a lot more, we can employ a lot more people with a nature-based economy than we were doing with our traditional extractive economies of sort of sheep ranching, which is basically what was there before. And this is a message that we can take to many parts of the world and say, look, you know, we want to see rural communities thriving. We, we want to see people continuing to make a living. We don't want to see people you know, collapsing communities being hammered by opioid addiction and suicide and all the terrible things, afflictions that we're seeing taking place around the world. So let's let's create a new economy, but an economy that can be sustained indefinitely, not an economy which is just taking what it can now and then the whole thing falls apart because there's nothing left to take, which is basically the way in which rural areas worldwide have been treated. We'll just exhaust the soil, we'll exhaust the minerals, we'll cut down the trees... And then capital moves on, leaving a wasteland behind, a social wasteland as well as an ecological wasteland. And then we can say to people, look, here's a better future, a future that can be sustained indefinitely for you and for the living world, that what is environmentally sustainable can also be economically sustainable. This reminds me of one of the main themes in your new book, Out of the Wreckage, but essential to this vision is the reclamations of the commons. And when I think about Chris and Doug Tompkins being able to purchase and support these large areas, these national parks, which in a way are the commons, it makes me think about the challenges of being able to re-inhabit the commons and, you know, whether that's land privatization or, you know, the state and the market in this broad economic sense so I'm wondering if you could speak about how the restoration of the commons is really crucial as we navigate this path of collective remembering and rewilding. The, the first thing to do is to recognise and understand the commons. And, and it's amazing how little we know of them. When we talk about the economy, we talk about it as if it's only got two corners, the, the state and the market. 
And broadly speaking, if you're on the left, you say you want more state and less market. And if you're on the right, you say you want more market and less state. But in having these discussions, we completely forget that actually the economy has four corners. There's the state, there's the market, there's the household, crucial part of the economy. Nothing else, no other part of the economy could function without the household. And because we don't recognise it, we devalue the role of women and the crucial economic work that they do, which keeps everybody else going. And then there's the commons. And people don't even know what the commons is. You know, everyone thinks they know what the state or the market is, but, but the commons, once upon a time, almost everything was the commons. All our land was held in common. Our water, our, our crucial resources, our fish, our forests, a whole lot of it was in common. But gradually, those common resources were grabbed, enclosed, primarily by the market, but also by the state, with devastating consequences for people. Well, what a commons is, is a particular resource which is managed and controlled by a particular community and managed in perpetuity. That resource is inalienable, it can't be sold, it can't be given away. And the aim of the community is to keep it going forever and then to share the product from that resource on an equal basis. And as a result, the rules and negotiations which the community creates are absolutely crucial they're an important part of the definition of a commons. And what the commons is, is, is not capitalism and it's not communism. It's something else entirely. It's, it's community management and community benefit on a shared and equal basis. So the land was once held in common almost everywhere. The concept of private land ownership was completely alien to people worldwide until the 15th century in Britain, it was in England that it was invented. And then it was spread through colonial conquest all over the world and then copied by other colonial powers and it became the dominant model. And now we can hardly conceive of being without it, but it's a very recent thing and a very alien thing to the whole of the rest of human history. And it's a highly destructive thing because when a commons is enclosed, not only is a community scattered and destroyed, with devastating consequences. I mean, I've seen with my own eyes what's happened to indigenous people when they lose their land. Their whole inner world collapses. They succumb to alienation and anomie and alcoholism and drug abuse and a whole series of mental health disorders. And those people are us. We are all living in a post-enclosure society because we lost our commons. Everybody lost their commons through the same processes. But it's not just that we lose ourselves in that. We lose the living world as well because the common system protected it. It, it, it. it ensured that it was always going to be there so that future generations could use it. But when, when that land is grabbed, when it's either privatised or seized by the state, people then try to extract as much profit from it as quickly as they can and reinvest that profit elsewhere. And that means turning the polycultures, the complex systems with which we lived into monocultures with devastating environmental consequences and gradually we're seeing that process creeping around the world. So what we have to do is to try to restore the commons and I think there are various means of doing it. When it comes to issues like land, I would like to see a land value tax on the most valuable properties which brings down the price of land for a start and then part of the product of that tax used to allow communities to buy land back and then start managing it in common, which is crucial both for our own well-being and for the well-being of the land and its ecosystems. At sea, I would love to see, instead of the smash and grab, free-for-all, open access system we have at the moment, I would like to see a common system where a community of fishers and other people, for that matter, divers and recreational anglers and wildlife watchers, whale watchers and the rest of it, manage an area in common together. And they don't let other people come and exploit it, but they say, right, this is under our control as a community, and we're going to make sure that all the wonderful species and ecosystems here are going to be sustained forever, so that we can continue to love and enjoy them and to make a living from them and they can continue to sustain the natural wonders of the marine world.
Thank you for explaining the commons in that way. It really made me think about our spiritual comprehension of what we're losing and have already lost. And I really question how we can fight for something we've never experienced. You know, if you see the forest getting cut down, you know what is being lost. But if the forest was cut down a thousand years ago, it's not so easy. But I do think that we all still yearn for wildness in the wake of biological loss. And in Feral, you use a term which was ecological boredom. It's enlivening to think that we hold the memories of our place within the wild web of life inside of us. You know, some call it genetic memory, some call it intuition or ancestral remembering. But no matter what you call it, it speaks to that dormancy of our survival instinct and the stagnation of our creativity, the vapidness of our once diverse ecosystems. How do we overcome ecological boredom, but not in a selfish sense, but in a sense that can help us be better stewards? So the term I settled on eventually, having tried quite a few, was a ghost psyche. That's what I feel we we possess. We have a whole set of psychological equipment that is most of the time hidden to us. We just don't know it's there. But it's equipment which is vestigial today. We don't need it for our survival. But perhaps we do need it for our psychological health. Perhaps it remains essential, but in ways which we don't know about, because it's not being exercised in the normal course of our lives. And I was made most aware of this, I guess, when I was foraging one day in some woods with some friends and we um, had vowed to ourselves that we were going to find and collect our dinner for that night. And it was a difficult time of year. It's in March. It's, it's during the hunger gap. There's not a lot around. And we found a few nettles, found one or two St George's mushrooms. You know, there was a bit of stuff around, but it wasn't much of a meal. And then I was... Um, Stepping down to this stream, and there beside the stream was a deer which had just died. It was still warm, its eyes were still bright. Now, you shouldn't pick up an animal which has just died and you have no idea why it's died, but I was too excited to think about that and to do this rationally, and I just got my hands round its ankles and I swung it onto my shoulders. And the moment I felt its weight and its warmth on my shoulders, I turned into a different creature. It was extraordinary. I mean, the way I'd describe it to myself was that civilization slid off as easily as a bathrobe. It was like I was naked. It was like I'd, I'd just become this new creature which was underneath the creature I thought I was. I wanted to roar. I wanted to thump my chest. I was like, Rrr! I had this thing which just seemed to fit perfectly around my shoulders. And and I was sort of holding up the weight of it. And, and it was, you know, I hadn't killed it or anything. I, I've never killed a large animal and I wouldn't want to. But, but I just had this sense that there was this person inside me that I hadn't known about until that point and subsequently I've had one or two other experiences that have reinforced that sense so they've given me this feeling that there's a whole lot of stuff buried in my brain which has always been there because basically it's stuff which helped us survive as hunters and gatherers but that we never get access to because we don't need to there's no material reason for for needing to but that those aspects of our minds are actually intense and rich and there's something rather beautiful about it. I mean, it's, and all of these occasions when I've had those feelings, it felt like taking some extraordinary drug which just transported me into a different world, the world of our ancestors. And I believe we have a duty to ourselves to lead a rich life. And of course, by that I don't mean a life with lots of money in it. I mean a life with a wealth of ecological experience. Because yes, ecologically bored, I think is what we are, because our ecological encounters at the moment do not delve into that deep psyche, that ghost psyche, those parts of the mind that we have neglected. But when I've had completely unexpected encounters with megafauna, for instance, when a bull bottlenose dolphin leapt over my kayak and just before it 
went back into the water, it looked back at me and for a split second we made eye contact and just held each other's gaze as I stared into its eye, it stared back into mine. And I had that feeling then, again, that sense of delving into a part of my mind that I had no idea was there before, a sense of pure ecstasy, of exhilaration. And those are the experiences to which we should expose ourselves. And by bringing back the megafauna, we bring back not only these crucial elements of the ecosystem, I believe they are crucial elements of our own psyche as well. It's a psychological rewilding, a psychological renewal that we get from the ecological rewilding. My mind grows dry and thirsty As the memories linger Drifting on the wind Through the mountains like a river Sweet smell of pine It's all western cedar Drifting on the wind Through the mountains like a river Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was Blow Gabriel by the Macintosh County Shouters, then Spirit Intrusion Removal Song of a Coffin Healer in Ecuador, then The Child Inside by Ewan McLennan and George Mambio from the album Breaking the Spell of Loneliness. Our theme music is Like a River by Kate Wolf and Silence Returns by Bo. I'd like to thank our producers, March Young and Reach Out, our research director, Madison Mogulski, and media director, Molly Lebov. If you value our content, go to iTunes.com and give us a rating. Also, sign up for our newsletter to keep in touch with all of our projects on our website at forthewild.world. Please support our Kickstarter by going to kickstarter.com and searching 1 million redwoods to make a pledge to help us reforest Cascadia.